This NBA Insider is presented by Coors Light. Go from full-time to game time. Coors Light, made to chill. Joining us on the line is Mark Stein, who needs no introduction, really, to anybody who covers basketball or follows basketball. What's up? What's up, Sonny Mo? Gentlemen, good to be with you. Good to get a little bit closer to Toronto from far away Dallas. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you're, you're probably as far from Toronto as possible. Uh, but listen, we, we wanted to talk uh, a couple of things. We actually wanted to talk about the Mavericks. They're, they're off to a 3 0 start, uh, and they're looking, you know, pretty, pretty promising. 125 points per game is pretty damn good. I think that's what the Raptors score in two days, maybe a whole weekend. Uh, but let's, let's, let's obviously talk about James Harden, the trade fallout. Uh, I wanted to think about it from the Clippers perspective. Um, you know, on, on one hand, they definitely did keep Terrence Mann out of this deal. Um, but, you know, they still ultimately end up surrendering two picks. And, uh, you know, it, it is a situation where they believe they have four. All four of these guys are free agents next year, the Stars. So, yeah, Stein, I'd, I'd love to hear your reaction to uh, the, the the James trade yesterday. There's only one winner if you guys want to do winners and losers today, and that's James Harden. James Ooh. Harden is the only immediate winner here. And it is truly amazing how we heard so much chatter in the summer that the player and power power era is over. And here's James Harden with supposedly no leverage and everybody know it all, me included saying, why did you opt in? If you want to, if you only want to go to the Clippers and that's the only team you want to play for. And even after opting in and seemingly forfeiting any semblance of control in the situation and, you know, doesn't go to media day, basically is a, a virtual non-participant in training camp and doesn't play in any of your preseason games, tries to get on one team flight, they won't let him go, and gets the exact trade that he wants. I mean, it is it is amazing. You know, I wrote a big piece about it on my sub stack yesterday. With no championship rings, that's always going to get thrown in his face when we assess his resume and his legacy. But the man is absolutely the undisputed NBA champion for getting what he wants. I mean, he forced a trade Houston to Brooklyn, Brooklyn to Philly, and now Philly to the Clippers. Uh, And that piece is up at markstein.substack.com if people want to read more. Mark, I'm curious what changed for Philadelphia in these days because it sounded the whole time like they were going to stick to their line. They were playing this game of chicken. They were willing to wait it out. Is it as simple as James Harden showed up and, and they didn't really expect him to and that kind of you know, then it was uh, not, yeah, you get some depth pieces and draft acquisition, but you, you don't want that headache hanging over things. What changed here? Because the what we'd heard all along was like Terrence Mann's inclusion, um, maybe the extra draft capital got them there. Wh- why did Philly bend on this when, when we'd heard they were willing to wait it out a little long, certainly longer than uh, a week? Yeah, Daryl Morey's patience is considered legendary, especially after what happened just a couple of years ago with Ben Simmons when, so many, again, external know-it-alls like me are on the outside saying, you've got to trade Ben Simmons. You can't do this to Joel Embiid. You can't waste the prime season of Embiid. But no, Daryl Morey waited all the way till deadline day and got the trade he wanted for Harden. So I think there was a sense that, yes, he'll, he'll wait again, and he will show more patience than any team in the league. But – I really, sorry about that. I think it's a combination of factors, really, that the fact that Maxi looks so good, Eastern Conference Player of the Week, he already looks like an all-star. But just, it was a very chaotic build-up to opening night with the no media day, virtually not practicing, how little they've seen Harden to this point. He wanted to get on the first flight to Milwaukee, and they told him not to join the team. I think the Sixers really reached the point that they just didn't even want to do this dance with drama any further. And they went into this thing. We want Terrence Mann and an unprotected first or two unprotected, unprotected first. And they got neither, but the Sixers would tell you they did get two first, you know, that they got 2028 unprotected from the Clippers. The 2026 first is going to be the worst of the three picks that OKC controls in 2026. But the Sixers feel like that is a good haul and a good enough haul at this point to move on. And, you know, it's a addition by subtraction mentality that removing Harden from the building now should make things 
you know, a lot calmer and easier, you know, for Nick Nurse, the first year coach, who's got to come in there and try to put all this together on the fly. Yeah. Um, Stein, I, I guess on the Clipper side of things, how is this going to work? Like, do you see these four players, uh, these four, you know, former all NBA players, some of them are uh, at least when healthy are still at the level in Kawhi and PG, but how do you see it all like blending together? Like can all four of these guys play on the floor together? Let's start, let's start there. I think their confidence would stem from the fact that Ty Lu has such a great touch with veterans and that he's the perfect coach to try to manage this. But, you know, kind of you, you asked me about the Clippers from the jump and, the reason I, I would say that James Harden is the only winner here right now, we're going to have to wait six months to judge mm. both Philly and the Clippers here from yeah. the Philly side. It's what they can turn these picks into in their quest to, to acquire a new third star that makes Joel Embiid happy. And from the Clippers perspective, yes, they kept Terrence Mann out of the deal. They kept Norman Powell out of the deal, which was important to them. Mm. They've addressed a major need in terms of a point guard and a floor leader. That's something we know the Clippers have wanted for a long, long time. They weren't going to get out of the West with the team they had. You could also make the case that they've, get, they've traded away so many picks over the years to put this team together that, you know, was keeping the 2028 first really going to save them if this thing unravels no it's you know one pick is not going to do that unless you're getting a Wembenyama type star so they were already all in and all that's true but yeah you said it all of these guys Russ and Harden are on expiring contracts Harden is ineligible to do a contract extension and Kawhi and Paul George who both missed tons of time in their first four seasons together they have player options for next season and they're going into a new building so there is a lot of risk here for the Clippers, and they do have to ask themselves the question, do we really have a team now that can win the West? They believe they do, but are the Denver Nuggets having sleepless nights about the Clippers adding James Harden to what they already have? I don't think so yet. Yeah, okay. So uh, obviously this being the Raptors show, I guess I want to ask you, is there any way this could sort of break – in favor or maybe break right for the Raptors. I think maybe from the Philadelphia perspective, because they have now at least not the star player that Daryl Morey really wanted to potentially flip James Harden into, but at least they have sort of the ingredients, some picks, uh, expiring contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Could the Raptors come and get involved? I know OG's already been sort of floated out there. I guess that's everyone's default, like go-to trade target. Um, How could that affect the Raptors? It definitely didn't take long for OG's name (laughs) to start getting thrown around (laughs) as a potential Sixers uh, trade target here. Okay. And look, this is something that the Raptors are going to have to really navigate because, you know, Ananobi can obviously become a free agent at season. Then the extension they can offer him only goes up to 117 million. And so he knows he's going to command a much higher figure. If he goes to free agency, it's really not in OG's best interest to do an extension. And so do the Raptors, you know, post Fred, post Kawhi, post Lowry, do they really want to take the risk of losing Ananobi and free agency? I mean, that's something, you know, it's, I think it, on one hand, it's too soon to really talk about it now where it's November 1st. But on the other hand, I'm sure for Raptors fans, it's never too soon to start thinking about these things because the Occam, Ananobi, Trent Jr., all of these guys have uncertain futures with the team. Really, you know, all the, all the main players apart from Scotty Barnes. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, Ananobi is going to be a popular name. There's no question. And it, it, you know, last season was filled with trade speculation. I, you know, I think one of the lines I wrote somewhere or said somewhere, I think, I think from January to July, maybe January to September, the Raptors might've led the league in trade speculation. There's no real way to measure that, but it sure felt like it. And, you know, I'm not sure that this season is going to be terribly different. Yeah, I'm sure you get tons of people writing to you uh, on Substack. Just like, hey, what's the news on the Raptors? What's the news on the Raptors? This and this and this. And, um, yeah, I mean, it definitely helps to fill the show. But it definitely, you know, creates a lot of uncertainty. But it's I'm, so early. 
No, it is so early, but hey, listen, you know, we got to set the tone early. All right, this is what the season is going to be about. No, um, maybe on happier times then, because again, this is a little too early for this, even if they do want to make a trade. They also, by the way, they obviously have Nick Nurse there too. Mm -hmm. You know, Nick obviously is a big OG fan, um, as he is a Pascal fan, for example. So those can also be uh, options. But um, the Mavericks, just, uh, I mean, look, I think they definitely did make a number of moves in the offseason. Obviously, they made the big trade for Kyrie uh, last year, the deadline. Um, but they didn't really impress. Not obviously, down the stretch, they they managed to tank their way back into their own pick. Then they flipped that pick, uh, and you know maybe there wasn't as much optimism around Dallas. Maybe you could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but so far so good. Three and zero. Luca's looking at an MVP. You know the more Luca magic moments already. Like, are you surprised that the, the, the Mavericks are off to this nice start here? Well, the schedule certainly helped, and you know they needed this kind of favorable start. They needed to start well because they went on that, it was the longest trip in preseason history in the league. I mean, they were gone for 12 days, two, two games in Abu Dhabi, one in Madrid. They come back with both Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving injured. And then, you know, so base, and then they had to basically, after 12 days abroad, they had to stay away from the gym for three days. So they couldn't even have their first real practice until October 16th, basically eight days before opening night. And so it was almost like they were starting over. Yeah. So their preparation for the season really was not ideal. And look, Kyrie Irving missed the last game with a foot issue. He's listed as doubtful for tonight. So Kyrie Irving can only play two of the four exhibition games. He's at risk for missing two of the first four regular season games. But, I mean, you guys said it. Luka has been not of this earth to start the season. I mean, he, when the three ball is going down on top of everything else he does, he is basically unguardable. And he's been reigning in threes to start the season. And it's crazy when you think about it. it um, you know, he made that one-hand bank shot. Yep at the end of the shot clock against Brooklyn, it was like right in front of me. And after the game, I was visiting with Mark Folliwell, the Mavs play-by-play -play man, and then the legendary Ian Eagle from the Nets broadcast. And we were just kind of all three just old dudes kind of marveling at this shot. And the great Ian Eagle said, he's like, can you clinch best shot of the season in game two of 82? And when you think about it, like Luca's shot, which was the cross between a jump hook and a shot put from 30 under duress. I was obviously lucky, but it was still ridiculous as well. We might have seen the best shot and the best pass of the season by Sunday because that Jokic 75 foot lob to Aaron Gordon side, side oh, out man. of bounds alley. I mean, we might have already seen the best pass of the season and the best shot of the season. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that, that MVP campaign. I mean, it, obviously, Luke is going to win some MVPs in his career. Uh, if he takes this Mavericks team with expectations around it coming into the year and the uncertainty coming around it, and he takes them to top four in the West, I can't really see why. Uh, he if he averages 40, 12, and 10. They'd have to win in the 50s. They'd have to win in the 50s, okay. and it's hard to see that with the roster they have. Yeah, but, I mean, with Luka the, playing the way he is, you, you never know, so... Stein, appreciate you. We're going to call you lots uh, throughout the season. But, uh, yeah, it, it's great to check in. And, obviously, when those uh, trade rumors come in, uh, we'll, be, we'll be the real-life people in, in the Substack chats being like, hey, any news on the Raptors, all right? I will do my best. And uh, just let me, know when the, let me know when we're doing the live show from Carousel Bakery. Is. <laughs> all right. That, was, that NBA Insider was presented by Coors Light. Go for full-time to game time. Coors Light made to chill.